And if you free up so much testosterone in the bloodstream, not only can it interact with the androgen receptors on white blood cells, but also increase the rate for aromatization or alpha reduction or just glucuronidation and faster excretion. I always felt that SHBG levels should stay somewhat sustained, mm -hmm. but it's very hard to do that when you go super physiological. Uh, we're going to talk uh, the role of uh, sex hormone binding globulin and binding proteins being albumin. Mm -hmm. And um, and then see what the implications are of free androgens. Because, of course, if we start ramping the dosages upwards of anabolic androgenic steroids, the sex hormone binding globulin levels go down. Albumin stays pretty much the same within the bloodstream. But the carrier proteins go down, freeing up more testosterone and other androgens. But it might have implications for your overall anabolism, libido, and health parameters as well. So, Dean, do you want to take it away from the start? Yeah. So, I guess this all goes back to... I believe nine, 1960s when the free hormone hypothesis was first mm -hmm. introduced, they they didn't understand at this point what exactly was sort of the the genomic response exactly for testosterone in terms of like how it entered the cell, how it was brought around the body. You know, was it a free hormone by itself? Did it have a carrier? And eventually, they they came to this sort of hypothesis that it was a hormone that diffused across the cellular membrane into the cytoplasm, interacted with the anger receptor attached to heat shock proteins, formed a complex and into the nucleus it went. So this was all predicated on you make a total amount of testosterone in your testicle or you inject a total amount. And of that, in general, about one to two percent of it is controlled as free hormone to interact directly with a, an androgen receptor or an aromatase enzyme, whatever. And there have been, you know, not arguments, but flaws versus SHBG being the thing that carries testosterone primarily around the body and that is what dictates the free hormone in that testosterone and dissociates off SHBG when it docks to an SHBG receptor on the cell. And we know that that is something that does contribute to the free level inside your cell. So there is an SHBG receptor mm -hmm. that is capable of carrying either one or two testosterone molecules. So it can either be a dimer or, or a monomer structure. And so you've got potentially with the monomer version it's carrying one part testosterone and the other part of the SHBG protein can dock to a receptor and feed that testosterone across. Or it can allow that testosterone to interact with, like Kurt said, there's an extracellular receptor right. or there's even G protein mm -hmm. signaling with testosterone that causes like elastin production and, and so forth, mm -hmm. which are non-genomic responses. So the SHBG, I don't think, you know, when you, when you read into it that we fully appreciate SHBG as its own secondar secondary messenger system that can cause um, a, a pathway of androgen expression. But it is important that, you know, at, at one point we would have all viewed, okay, let's crash SHBG into the ground. We're going to get a sky, a sky high free androgen index, which basically means that very little amounts of your testosterone are associated to SHBG or your free testosterone level is going to be sky high at like four, four or 5%, which is way beyond what you, you would normally have in serum. I guess, you know, to go back to even like the, the androgen receptor discussion, the more free hormone you now have in your bloodstream, the more free open targets start for that testosterone to get to work. And it's, we often always fall into the trap of like, oh, well, my total testosterone level is like 2000 nanogram per deciliter. Yeah, that's great. That's the total amount. You could have, I guess, per metabolic health that's increasing SHBG and your free hormone level doesn't actually reflect the high total. The reverse of it is you could have a free at a free level that is very high to match that very high level of total testosterone. And that is the the paradox of why we do even TRT. TRT increases your total testosterone, but in the process tells your liver to decrease SHBG, which in tandem raises your free testosterone mm -hmm. level. So you're putting more testosterone in to gain more free because of the knock-on effect to SHBG. Mm -hmm. But 
I guess from a, an, an overall perspective of what can SHBG do, you know, there is some level of evidence towards non-genomic aspects of our neural health. So it becomes important for free hormone in our neurons, which then affects neurotransmission. Uh, other than that, I guess the more free hormone, like I said, you've got, the more now can interact with 5-alpha reductase or aromatase intracellularly and increase estradiol, increase DHT. Interact sort of what I simplify as androgen spillover. Now you've got too many free androgens that if you don't have the muscle tissue to accommodate that free hormone, like Kurt said, you've now got androgen receptors in your cardiac tissue being activated. You've got androgen receptors, you know, influencing thyroid receptor sensitivity that is now causing maybe tachycardia symptoms like mm -hmm. your elevated heart rate, elevated blood pressure, angiotensin too, you know, that we bash on about. And tell me certain that free hormone increases potential angiotensin 2 expression, mm -hmm. which would increase blood pressure. So there is, I, I guess, a fine balance of, yes, we want as much optimal amounts of free hormone because it's what's going to give us the genomic response. But we also have to realize that SHBG has been created in our body for a reason as a sort mm -hmm. of protectant of controlling that free hormone amount within our serum. Yep. Yeah. Too much free hormone is just excreted faster too. So you're just, you're yeah. just constantly turning. You don't, you know what I mean? You want it in, in that range. You don't want it necessarily too low or too high. And I don't typically focus on SHBG in and of itself. Like I would look at more things that control, like estrogen will move it up and down, right? Other drugs will move it up and down. Like you see yeah. with Primo, Primo tends to free up a ton of test. Yeah. The same as Proviron and Mastron yeah. to a certain extent. So what, what I always saw is that sexual hormone binding globulin and albumin are transport proteins to mm -hmm. carry these hormones through the blood and deliver it to androgen receptor uh, specific tissue. And if you free up so much testosterone in the bloodstream, not only can it interact with the androgen receptors on white blood cells, maybe shortening its active life, um, and that's why serum concentrations go down over time, but also increase the rate for aromatization or 5 alpha reduction or just glucuronidation and like Kurt said, you know, faster excretion through the kidneys. So I always felt that SHPG level should stay somewhat sustained, mm -hmm. but it's very hard to do that when you go super physiological or start adding in compounds like provirin, which have a very high binding affinity for the sexual one binding globulin. Maybe, what is it, 682 times? I'll, I'll put it on the screen. I think it's like, well, it, it's very, very high compared to the other steroids. And even compared to diet of testosterone, it's incredibly high. So, um, Proviron has, where is it? Oh, yeah, I had it. Binding here. affinity is huge. Yeah, 82 to 440 compared yeah. to diet of testosterone, where diet of testosterone is 100. And then testosterone itself only has a relative binding affinity of 19 to 82. So that's significantly yeah. lower. Now, 5-alpha um, reduction should be, that's a genetic thing. That's controlled. That shouldn't increase. I think there's some misunderstanding there because it's not going to increase. You're not going to increase 5-alpha reduction by pushing something one way. That's inside the mm -hmm. cell and that's controlled. We can't really okay. increase that amount. I think that's where, that's where like the... The other guy in Thailand with his theories. That's where mm -hmm. I think his things go wrong with DHT is the only thing that causes hair loss because that's a controlled thing. Androgens right. cause hair loss. So it's it's not more free testosterone converting into diet of testosterone because there's just there's a rate limit. There's a rate limit on the, the three yeah. forms of the alpha reductase yeah. enzyme. Okay. And once DHT is back in serum, so it gets booted out of the cell and it's bound to sex hormone binding glove, and it's completely useless. So testing yeah. serum DHT doesn't tell you anything. True. True. So, yeah. So it's, I guess, when you look at that, like even free hormone hypothesis and SHBG, you then get people who sort of hyper focus on, oh, well, my SHBG is very low. How do I raise it? And that sort of brings them discussion of what controls SHBG expression from the liver. And that's generally three simple things. It's either too much estrogen is telling the liver then to make more SHBG to transport it. Too much thyroid hormone, so hyperthyroidism, so too much active T3 in the bloodstream. And then the other one that can catch people off guard is low insulin or type 1 diabetes. So yeah. when there's a, a low insulin expression, for some reason it induces a metabolic response to increase SHBG. I'm not exactly sure why the body 
feels that it needs to bind more sex hormone when there's low testosterone, it's probably got something to do with glycolysis and trying to preserve glycolytic yeah. function. Yeah, that yeah. is why. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it senses that it's in a, in a caloric, caloric, uh, or a chronic nutrient deficit, and then binding up more free uh, testosterone in SHBG lowers metabolic function, preserving muscle mass and overall uh, body weight. Yeah, well, and just a, a simple face value way of explaining is, you know, type one diabetes is not a state that the body wants to really grow muscle in, right? Like mm -hmm. it's a, it's a disease state. It's not it's not looking to to get more muscular and flourish, right? right? Like yeah, it's trying to control the disease. You see, clearly see it with natural carnivore guys or natural ketogenic uh, diet guys, is that their SHBG levels are sky freaking high because their insulin levels are so chronically low. Mm -hmm. And having a little bit of carbohydrates over the day, maybe 50 to 70 grams post-workout already resolves that. But if you want to increase your SHBG levels and you don't want to bring your serum estradiol levels sky high or go to the thyroid medication, yeah. then yeah, excluding carbohydrates is a good idea, but excluding carbohydrates is also not very anabolic. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's self-fulfilling in that sense, right? It's... <laughs> I mean, I've been doing a ketogenic diet for years, and it's, I, I can tell you firsthand that it's not the most anabolic diet to follow. Um, you need but a your significant diet, amount of... Your diet makes yeah. sense, though, because you still have carbs. You have carbs post-workout, you have them at night, yeah. like, at least your recent mm -hmm. diet that you posted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I right. just have fruit post-workout, and yeah. then, of course, on Sunday a little bit. Yeah. So I, I still make sure that I get adequate carbohydrates in for, for normal metabolism and all yeah. the micronutrients that are found in carbohydrates. But, you know, for cognition, like basically what Dean is doing, intermittent fasting... I just have a protein, fats, and vegetables during the day, mm -hmm. and that allows my cognition to keep going. And then at one point, I'll, I'll get out of ketosis post-workout when cognition is no longer required. It's the end of my day. Yep. Uh. So I guess, you know, even that, that tr not trend, but you've got a lot of people that will include Provirin in terms of a stack design. You know, yeah, it's great. You're going to have more free hormone, but then... I guess that will tie into potentially what we were going to talk about as well is, you know, neural oxidative stress. So now you've got more free hormone that can have non-genomic effects. So we're now talking about like uh, intracellular calcium signaling. And now we're influencing how neurons are firing in mm -hmm. the brain, how potentially you're going to get issues with uh, Increased neurotransmission, which can be a good thing, and you, know, you get more dopamine, you get more driven. But the other side of it then is that neurons consistently being exposed to high amounts of dopamine and dopaminergic signaling, it, it actually causes hyper excitability, and that tells uh, effectively diminished nerve response, or you can overstimulate the nerve, and the nerve dies. Yep. So, you know, there's a, a very fine balance here of how how do you keep that sort of free hormone level in an optimal position, which none of us, I, I don't know. There's, no, you knows? know, free free androgen index, free testosterone level. When you're looking at sort of a, a stack setup, all you're looking at is that you're in a, I guess, a position at above 2% free testosterone, because at that point you're above where you would have sat homeostasis, homeostatically or from a homeostasis perspective. But there's just nothing really like then you start feeding into, well, if I'm going to be exposed now to more free androgens, how am I protecting the body from the sort of excess of signaling that comes from? So whether that's mitochondrial reactive oxygen species production, whether that is that nerve uh, overstimulation or overexcitation, whether that is a, an imbalance between dopamine and serotonin expression mm -hmm. and, and why you know certain people might take SSRIs in terms of like an ancillary medication in order to keep that balance between serotonin and dopamine in their brain when the androgens are forcing them down a, a dopamine a dopamine mm -hmm. dominant pathway mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a, I guess it's it's like I said the paradox there of the more testosterone or androgens you have the lower your SHBG goes and that gives you your cause and effect you know more free hormone to in interact is there an optimal place no one knows it's very, it's very hard no. to say because and it moves just, and it, yeah it moves also and of course insulin and growth hormone also play a you know, suppressive role mm. so if you go with intelligent cycle design and you limit the anabolics right you have one testosterone a diet of testosterone derivative and you're keeping estradiol favorable to the point shbg is let's say middle of the reference range, 
you add in a little bit of growth hormone and insulin, it will still come down. And some guys get a beautiful response from that, right? They're composed, they're calm, they're focused, but they get a good amount of anabolism out of it. So you would say that there's no neurological decline from these free androgens that are floating around. But SHBG is not low enough to the point it doesn't increase cyclic adenosine monophosphate and has this non-genomic overlapping effect on, on androgen-mediated gene transcription, right? So it, it, it's very hard to say because I've also seen guys with bottomed-out SHBG levels which have no adverse effects either. And other guys with bottomed-out SHBG levels which have all the issues, mm -hmm. right? Libido doesn't work. Mental well-being is destroyed. It's so... Is it solely because of the SHBG or what else is going on? It's, it's so hard to say. And there is recombinant sex hormone binding globulin out there. Um, I think Sigma Aldrich has it for mm -hmm. sale. It's highly expensive. I, I would love to run an experiment just to add that to a stack and see if there's any noticeable difference. Because I do think so. Because you see with being off cycle for longer periods of time, your SHBG really goes high. And in the beginning, the response is so great to introducing a little bit of steroids. And I think SHBG has a part of that because as soon as SHBG levels start to tank and they get to the middle bottom of the reference range, there are diminishing returns. So, but this this will never be proven, I guess, because I don't have access to recombinant SHBG. Um, but I do think it would be a good ancillary to add alongside the high dose of testosterone just to keep SHBG in the middle or high, high ranges and, and uh, prove that or disprove that SHBG is a contributing role in anabolism and in overall uh, mental health, right? By bounding up these androgens and just delivering them to skeletal muscle. Will it ever take place? I highly doubt it. <laughs> yeah. 